Welcome back to the Counter Vortex, your weekly roundup of underreported news and views from around the world with an unapologetically radical dissident left perspective brought to you by your chief reporter, ranter, and blogger, Bill Weinberg. That would be me. There have been urgent calls from around the planet for a long-term ceasefire to bring an end to more than two months of bombardment and a spiraling humanitarian catastrophe in the Gaza Strip. Over 20,000 people have now been killed in Israel's aerial campaign and ground invasion, according to the health ministry in the Strip with over 80% of the 2.3 million residents of the enclave displaced from their homes. While Washington has continued to support Israel's war effort, including through massive weapons transfers, Israel has paid little heed to belated U.S. calls to try to limit civilian casualties and allow more access for humanitarian aid. Israel now says its war against Hamas could last months, with aid agencies already struggling to operate amid food shortages and outbreaks of disease. The impact of a prolonged war in the Strip challenges the imagination. With international eyes on the catastrophe in the Gaza Strip, An economic and human rights crisis is rapidly unfolding in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. Violence by both the Israeli army and settlers is escalating, with entire Palestinian villages emptied, the residents forced to flee. Intensified restrictions on mobility are being imposed by the occupation forces. Work permits are being canceled by the tens of thousands. And tax revenues that Israel collects on West Bank exports are being withheld from the Palestinian Authority. At least 290 Palestinians, including 75 children, have been killed since October 7th, double the figure for all of last year. The leadership of Yemen's Houthi armed movement issued a statement saying they would not halt their military operations in the Red Sea unless Israel stops its genocide crimes in Gaza and allows humanitarian aid to enter the Strip. The move comes despite the U.S. announcement of a new naval coalition to counter the attacks. The Houthis, backed by Iran, have launched over a dozen attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea since Israel's bombardment of Gaza began in early October. A range of drones and ballistic missiles have been deployed against vessels in the Bab al-Mandab Strait, or Gate of Tears, which separates the Horn of Africa from the Arabian Peninsula, a choke point for global trade. Shipping firms have already started to pull their vessels from the Red Sea route, opting for the much longer passage around Africa. The closing of the Red Sea to shipping has obvious implications for the price of oil and the ongoing worldwide food and energy crisis. In a new report, Human Rights Watch charges that both the Houthis and government forces have violated residents' right to water in the ongoing siege of Taiz, Yemen. For the past eight years, the besieging Houthi forces have cut off the flow from watersheds under their control to the Taiz Local Water and Sanitation Corporation, which manages the city's water supply and sewage treatment system. These watersheds previously provided 77% of the city's supply. The government troops that control the city have meanwhile sold the public water from wells within the urban area for their own profit. Human Rights Watch called on both parties to, quote, allow Taiz's local water agency to access, 
repair, and operate water infrastructure on the front lines and in Houthi-controlled territory. The COP28 climate summit concluded in the United Arab Emirates with a so-called UAE consensus to transition away from fossil fuels, quote-unquote, hailed as an historic first commitment to eliminate the principal cause of climate change. Many climate activists, however, assail the document as vague and non-binding. Another failure pointed to by skeptics is the lack of finance commitments to come out of COP28, the funds made available by rich countries to help developing countries adapt and transition continue to lag far behind what is needed. A new collective quantified goal for climate finance is set to be discussed next year at COP29 to be held in Azerbaijan. The Counter Vortex now has a weekly vlog with our roundup of underreported news and views from around the world. You can subscribe to our new YouTube channel and please share on social media. If you wish to receive our weekly headlines and digest by email, you can subscribe to that via Substack. To keep this work going, please make a small or medium-sized or large donation to our year-end fund drive. We aspire to reach just $500 by year's end, a small fraction of our annual operating costs, and we're already on our way thanks to five readers in New York City, Los Angeles, Milan, Italy, and Gloucestershire, UK. A total of $180 has already come in, so 320 to go. If you appreciate what we offer each week, please do your part. In episode 205 of the Counter Vortex podcast, Bill Weinberg, that would be me, looks at the recent re escalation and hopefully denouement of the dispute over Essequibo, an oil rich territory controlled by Guyana and claimed by Venezuela. Ironically, this claim was first asserted by the conservative anti communist Venezuela of the 1960s to help destabilize the anti-imperialist Guyana of Chetty Jagan. Today, the left populist but increasingly nationalistic regime of Nicolas Maduro even entertains hubristic claims to sovereignty over Venezuela's other, much larger neighbor, Colombia. But this revanchism appears to mask the fact that revolutionary Venezuela largely remains a petro-state with a rentier economy, vulnerable to drops in the global oil price, even if Chinese corporate exploiters have been replacing gringo ones. With the recent easing of sanctions, U.S. giants like Chevron have even returned to Venezuela, while the extractivist model results in indigenous resistance. Contrary to the dogmas of left and right alike, the real root of the Venezuelan crisis is that the country is insufficiently socialist. Listen on Patreon, patreon.com slash countervortex. And while you're there, please subscribe. President Joe Biden announced a new pardon policy for federal cannabis offenses. Biden stated, quote, too many lives have been upended because of our failed approach to marijuana. It's time we right these wrongs, unquote. This expands Biden's similar mass pardon of all federal offenses for simple cannabis possession issued in October 2022. The new proclamation goes further in that it forgives all instances of simple cannabis use or possession under federal law or on federal land, including anywhere in Washington, D.C., and extends to those who have never been charged. 
The move is still largely symbolic, however, implicitly acknowledging that the overwhelming majority of cannabis-related arrests and convictions occur at the state level, Biden called upon officials in the 50 states to take similar steps. You can read about that on our sibling website, Global Ganja Report, globalganjareport.org, resisting the eradication regime, defending your right to cannabis. And do follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. And please join us next week for the Counter Vortex.